<clears throat> this morning, I'd like to read for you a portion of John's Gospel. We're going to be um, <coughs> excuse me, looking at verses 1 through 3 of John chapter 1, but I'd like to begin by reading the first 18 verses of the book, because basically in the first 18 verses, John is introducing to us Jesus Christ, who he is. This is his introduction to the book, and really lays somewhat of a groundwork uh, uh, to what it is he's going to be showing us in the rest of the book through the things that Jesus said and the things that Jesus did. So as we see John making these claims about Jesus, let's not forget that it isn't just a claim, but Jesus is going to prove that he is in fact who John says that he is through the various signs that John is going to show to us. Now we're not going to look at the entire introduction, the entire prologue. We are going to read it. But at least we'll um, set the, the groundwork for what we are going to see in the first uh, three verses of John's Gospel. Let me begin, begin reading in verse 1. John writes this, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through Him, and apart from Him nothing came into being that has come into being. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. There came a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify about the light so that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but he came to testify about the light. There was the true light which, coming into the world, enlightens every man. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, and those who were his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw his glory, glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. John testified about him and cried out, saying, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me has a, rank, a higher rank than I, for he existed before me. For of his fullness we have all received, and grace upon grace, for the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth were realized through Jesus Christ. No one has seen God at any time the only begotten God who is in the bosom of the Father. He has explained him. Now, uh, again, that, that ends the reading of God's word this morning. We're going to be looking at verses 1 through 3, but one thing we need to bear in mind as we go through <laughs> this first, these first 18 verses, they are kind of theologically loaded. They're, they're kind of full. This is one of the reasons why... Um, John is a difficult book to understand because there's, there is a lot of you know, theology going on in here and not just the straightforward accounting of some of the things that we see in, in the other Gospels. So if we do get a little bit heavy on theology in this particular section, I do want you to understand it's not the entire book. The entire book isn't like that, uh, but these particular verses uh, are. Now again, last week we started the Gospel of John by looking at the end of the book where he plainly tells us why it is he wrote the book and that's always something that's very helpful to know why is it that he wrote what he did because his purpose is going to shape what he writes he's you know basically every one of these gospels is an argument an argument for who Jesus is and the one thing that John sets out to prove is who he is more particularly that he is the Christ but that he is the Son of God. Let me just read again for you John 20, verses 30 through 31. Therefore, many other signs Jesus also performed in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, 
the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. Now, during his ministry on earth, Jesus did many things. So many things that John says the world itself could not contain the books that would be written if they were written down in detail. But John selected certain of these works, which he calls signs, and he wrote about them for two reasons, that you may know who Jesus is, that he is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life in his name. Again, not physical life, you have that coming into the world, but that you might escape spiritual death, the death you come into the world, the judgment of sin, and that you might live eternally, as we saw last week, what eternal life is, a quality of life and a duration of life, that you might live forever in heaven. Now let me just remind you of three things we saw last week. First of all, that uh, John didn't just claim that Jesus was the Christ, the Son of God. And you know what? Jesus didn't just go around saying that he was without offering proof. John shows us by writing down his eyewitness account of what Jesus actually did to, the, to prove to us who he is. The miracles that he performs, the signs, validate his claim to be God in human flesh. Second thing we saw that this is who the Messiah is, who Christ is. He is the Son of Man. He is the Son of David. He is the Son of Abraham but he is also the Son of God. And again, this is the Christ you must believe in if you are to have eternal life. You must believe that he is God. And thirdly, we also noted that believing is more than just accepting the facts. It's more than just knowing who Jesus Christ is. It's more than just believing these things are true, that he is who he said he, he was and that he did what he said he did. Believing is an active word. It means you also need to receive him. You need to trust him to get you into heaven. Trust him as the Messiah, as the anointed one God sent into the world to save whoever believes in him from their sins. You need to actually actively trust him. And to do this, you need to turn from your sins. You cannot trust Jesus as your Savior and your Messiah from sin. As long as you're holding on to your sins, you need to turn from all of your sins. You need to obey his commands. That's not a very popular thing to say today. Neither is hell a very popular doctrine. But it is true. You need to believe it. And you need to submit to this one who is the king of kings and lord of lords. You need to obey him. And again, remember what it is you must obey, what it is you must turn from. Sin as he defines it. Obedience as he defines it. Not as we're wanting to believe it is. What we're going to be judged by is God's word. He gave it to us so that we might read it, so that we might know what he wants us to do, and that we might by his grace do it. That is what we will do if we are trusting in Jesus Christ. And if we are, and if we are believing in the one who is God in human flesh, we are saved. Now having laid this foundation, let's look at how John begins his gospel. In the section we just read, uh, what is considered to be the introduction to his gospel, John actually gives to us four things. We're only going to look at one of them this morning. He tells us plainly that Jesus is God. He tells us that he is the light of the world. He is the light of life. He tells us that in order to receive him, you must be born of God. He, he begins to broach that subject of God's sovereignty right away. And he tells us that he became a man to, among other things, reveal God the Father to us. By the way, that is what is tied into why he is called the Logos, why he is called the Word of God. We're not going to examine that right now, but we'll save it for that particular section. But this morning, as I've said, we want to begin with this first part of the introduction, what it is that John tells us first, with the fact that Jesus is God. Now again, I want to, to emphasize that for two reasons. First of all, you need to believe that in order to be saved. But secondly, you need to believe that and you need to be able to defend that and share that with others if they're going to be saved as well. Uh, not the least of which with those people that come to your door in twos and want to tell you that Jesus is a creature, that he is a God and not the God, that he is, again, not God in human flesh, 
that he is an angel at best, okay? So we need to be able to defend our faith. So hopefully this will be helpful in that regard as well. So first of all, John gives us four things that point to his deity. By the way, add this to what we saw last week. You know, we surveyed the the Gospel of John to see all the different ways in which John shows that Jesus is God. We're going to look at a few others. There's, There's many in this Gospel. So he gives us four things that point to his deity. The first one is that he is eternal. The second one is that he is the creator. The third one is that John basically says he is God. I mean, you know, how much plainer do you want? And then fourthly, and not so much pointing to the fact that Jesus is God, he's pointing to the Trinity, that Jesus is not the only one who is called God. So let's look first at the fact that Jesus is eternal, and so he is God, because only God exists eternally, outside of time, forever as it were. Or again, we, we can't talk about things in any, any other way than using terms that have to do with time. So words are going to fall short in expressing this, but he dwells in the eternal now, and only God does so. John tells us in verse 1, in the beginning was the Word, and he tells us in verse 2, he was in the beginning with God. Now what is this beginning that John is referring to? Well, he's referring to the same beginning that that, uh, Moses wrote about in Genesis 1.1. In the beginning... God created the heavens and the earth. What he's talking about here is the absolute beginning of all things. He's referring to the point, if we can use maybe that terminology, the point when God spoke and the clock began ticking. That is when time started. When he commanded, let it be, and the whole universe le- you know, leapt or leaped into existence. He's talking about when, if we can, again, that's a time-bound term, but when only God existed in the eternal now, at that point, before time, the beginning, the Word, he says, was there. Now, I've already told you who the Word is. You know who the Word is, and the reason why you know who the Word is is because John tells us who he is in verse 14. He's talking about Jesus Christ. He's talking about His eternal existence as the Son of God. We read in verse 14, and the Word became flesh. Notice that He was existing before He became flesh and dwelt among us and we saw His glory. Glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So who is this Word who exists in eternity? He is the one who came into the world, the one who took your nature on himself to do what God required of you in order to be saved. Again, he's the only one who could have done this. Now, let me just point out to you again, the Bible says there is only one who is eternal, and that is God. Moses writes in Deuteronomy 33, verses 26 and 27, there is none like the God of Jeshurun, who rides the heavens to your help and through the skies in his majesty. The eternal God is a dwelling place, and underneath are the everlasting arms. He writes in Psalm 90, verses 1 and 2, Lord, this is Moses speaking, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were born, or you gave birth to the earth and to the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. God. Now, why is it that that Moses, actually writing in both of these texts, is emphasizing the eternality of God, the fact that he never changes, the fact he's always the same, the fact that he has always existed and always will? It's because he wants Israel to understand who this God is, that, that he has not only made certain promises, but he has the ability to keep them. He is an everlasting dwelling to his people. He is a, a refuge, as it were, one you can run to. When you're in difficulty, one you can always rely on to be there to to help you. And let me just say that that is what distinguishes him from all the other so-called gods of the world is that he exists eternally and therefore you should trust him. Well, John is telling us that Jesus is eternal, but there is only one who is eternal and that is God, so he must be God. But that's exactly what Isaiah prophesied in Isaiah 9 verse 6. 
He says, for a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders, and his name will be, will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. Let me just remind you that the name Eternal Father, uh, that Isaiah is not saying that Jesus is the Father, but literally this means the Father of eternity. He is the Lord of time. He is not the Father, but He is the eternally existing One. He is God. The author to the Hebrews tells us the same in Hebrews chapter 1, verses 10 through 12. Speaking about Jesus Christ, He says this, You, Lord, in the beginning laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the works of Your hands. They will perish, but You remain. They all will become old like a garment, and like a mantle you will roll them up like a garment. They will also be changed, but you are the same, and your years will not come to an end. Now again, he is the same eternally. He was the one who was there in the beginning. Now, the author to the Hebrews is telling us, as we're going to see in just a moment, not, you know, that, that Jesus is the creator, but he's also telling us here that he is eternal that's what we saw last week as well when Jesus said of himself to the Jews in eight, uh, John 8, verse 58, Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was born, I am. Before Abraham ever came into being, Jesus already was. But again, he doesn't say I was, but he says I am. In other words, he is not bound by time. He was not existing in time. He was existing, as it were, outside of time in the eternal now, even when the clock started. God is not limited or dwelling within time. God is one who is timeless. And Jesus says before Abraham was born, he was in this state of timelessness. As a matter of fact, he's using again the very name of God here. I am is the covenant name of God. That's what Yahweh means. Exodus 3 verse 4, I am who I am. Moses, well, the Lord said to Moses, you shall say to the children of Israel, I am has sent you. Well, that's exactly what Jesus was calling himself by the covenant name of God, the one who is the eternally existing one. Jesus says, I am that one. You see, I am God. Now, Jehovah's Witnesses don't seem to understand what Jesus was saying here. They believe that Jesus is a creature. They believe that he is a creation of God. But I do want you to understand that the Jews knew exactly what Jesus was saying as evidenced by how they responded in John 8, 59. Therefore, they picked up stones to throw at him. But Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple. On one occasion, and I think perhaps the same occasion, Jesus said, why do you want to kill me? He says, you know, because of a miracle I did? He says, not because of any miracle, but because you, a man, claim to be God. See, the Jews were not, you know, they weren't confused about what Jesus was saying. They understood perfectly what he was saying. Something Jehovah's Witnesses don't, but you must not make the same mistake. You must believe that Jesus is who he said he is. Do you recognize that about Jesus? Do you believe that he is the eternal God? If you would be saved, that's what you must believe. Now, secondly, John says Jesus is the creator, and so he is God. He says in verse 3 of John 1, All things came into being through him, and apart from him nothing came into being that has come into being. Now, again, here the Jehovah's Witnesses are going to do a little bit of a slither, and they capitalize on this word through him. Notice the, or this phrase. Notice John says they came into being through him. What does John mean by that? Well, he means that Jesus made them. He is the creator. Jehovah's Witnesses believe that he's like this conduit or this instrument that the Father used to create all things. I'm not sure exactly how you use him to do that, but they believe that that is the case. The Father created, but he did it through Jesus. But I want you to understand that's not what John is saying here. What he's saying is that Jesus is the one who created. Through him means by him. Now, I need to give you a little bit of a grammar lesson if you're not already familiar with this, this idea of the active and passive voice.
because if you don't understand that, you won't understand what John is saying. So I'll, I'll give you an example. When you want to express an action, or, or let's say, um, who does an action in the passive voice? You have to do it with a preposition, either the, the word through or the word by. And let me give you an example. In the active voice, the boy threw the ball. Okay, the boy is the, is the subject. Throw is the action, the ball is the object, but you have the active voice in the verb, the boy threw the ball. Okay, the boy is acting here. But this can also be written in the passive voice. The ball was thrown. Okay, now the ball is actually receiving the action, but the ball is not the subject, okay? Uh, the, the ball was, well, actually it is the subject. The ball was thrown, passive voice. But who threw it? The ball was thrown by the boy, you see? Now I've used the passive voice and I've explained who the agent is by using this preposition by. Well, in the same way, we could write this, you know, what John puts here, what he wrote here in the active voice. And if you did, it would be like this. He, that is the word, brought all things into being. Okay, that's the active voice. But if you're going to put it in the passive voice, you put it this way. All things came into being by him or through him. And that's exactly what John is saying. He's saying, in essence, he brought all things into being. He's not just an agent of creation. Not something the Father used and he did it through Jesus Jesus is the one who did it. It was done by him. I hope that's plain because Jesus is the creator. Now remember what we just saw from the author to the Hebrews, what he says about Jesus in Hebrews 1 verse 10. You, Lord, in the beginning laid the foundation of the earth and the heavens are the works of your hands. He is speaking here directly about Jesus. Jesus founded the earth. Jesus made the heavens. He is the creator. And I do want you to notice that John doesn't say he just created some things, but he created everything. Again, John 1, verse 3. All things came into being through him or by him. He created all things. And apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. I've already told you that Jehovah's Witnesses believe that Jesus is a creature, that he is a created being. They believe he is the first creation of God, and they use such passages as Colossians 1, verses 15 through 17, when it calls Jesus the firstborn of all creation. They believe he was the one that was brought forth first. Now, if you ever run into a Jehovah's Witness that says that, you just point to the psalm, and I don't have the reference at hand right now, but you'll probably are familiar with it when... The psalmist is basically saying, I have made David my firstborn. But David wasn't the firstborn, was he? He was the lastborn. He was the youngest of Jesse's sons. So what does it mean that he's the firstborn? That he was born first? No, it means that he was given preeminence among his brothers so that he becomes king. And when it says that Jesus is the firstborn of all creation, it doesn't mean that he's a creature that is the first creation of God, but it means he has preeminence over all the creation. It was made by him and for him, you see, for his glory, that he might redeem it and he might redeem his people uh, in it. So again, Jesus is not a creature. He is the creator. He didn't create just some things, everything besides himself. I think the New World, I don't want to call it a translation, but the New World perversion of Scripture that the Jehovah's Witnesses use would say everything besides him. It's not everything besides him. He created all things and he himself is the creator, not a creature. Obviously, he didn't create himself. He is the creator, therefore he must be God. Now to make this point even plainer, John tells us as much in verse one. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. Now, if you've ever talked to a Jehovah's Witnesses, you know, you, you understand, again, they just, they try to get around the plain meaning of the words in their New World translation of the Scriptures, which is really a paraphrase. It's not translated from the original languages. It was paraphrased by their leader who added extra words in there trying to cover over the deity of Jesus Christ. Well, they change it to this, and the word was a God. 
with a lowercase g. Not the almighty God, but a lesser God. Now, not only does that prove too much, I mean, even more than they want to say, because the Bible says there is only one God, and all the other gods are false gods, but it is a complete mistranslation of the Greek, again, showing us that it really isn't a translation, that the one who put the translation or whatever together didn't even know the Greek language. It's just an attempt to cover up what it actually says. Now, here's another grammar lesson. The Greek language has the definite article, like we have in English, the word the, okay? When something is indefinite, they just don't put the article in. Now, the difference between something that's definite and indefinite would mean like this. If we want to talk about a definite boy, a particular boy, one that we're trying to single out among all other boys, we say the boy. And when we want to use something or want to make it indefinite, we say a boy or a certain boy or a boy in general. Now, Jehovah's Witnesses believe that when the apostles wanted to point to the almighty God, you know, the true God, they used the definite article, the God. But when to this lesser God, they use the indefinite uh, construction, as it were, they leave the article out. Just so happens that in the, in the clause, the word was God in John 1.1, 1, 1, there's no definite article before the word God. So they believe it points to a lesser God. They believe that should be translated the word was a God. Well, again, not only does this prove more than they want to prove that Jesus is not only not the true God, but that he is a false God, because God says in Isaiah 44, verse 6, that there is only one true God. Thus says the Lord, the, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and the last, and there is no God besides me. But it is, as I've said, an entire mistranslation. Let me just explain this simply, and I hopefully it will be understandable. There's a simple rule in Greek that says when you have two nouns that are, that are put together with a form of to be, to be, you know, is, are, were, was, and so forth, that you distinguish the subject from the predicate by using the definite article. Okay? If you want to show what the subject is, you put the article with the subject, and you don't use it with the other word. Okay? They're both in the same case, if that makes any sense. They're a nominative case. Okay, you've got these two words that are in this certain case, and you have this form of to be. Which one goes first? You know? If you understand what it means that something is predicated, you want to say like the ball is red. You're saying the ball is the subject, and red is what you want to say about the ball. This is a certain quality that the ball has. You don't say um, red is the ball, you know, or you can put it that way, or the red is ball. You see, you would get confused. What you're saying is the ball, being the subject, is red. Well, in this case, what we're saying here is the word is God, not God is God the word. John is simply trying to point out what is true of the word. What is he saying about the word? What is he saying is, is the quality or this, this, what is he predicating? You know, what's he saying is true about it? What he's saying is the word is God, you say. Now, sometimes a noun is definite enough in the language so you don't have to use the article to distinguish, you know, which one you're talking about. The author doesn't feel the need to include it. For instance, as you get to verse 6 in John, uh, for John 1, we read this. There came a man sent from God whose name was John. Well, what, what God are we talking about here, John? Some false God? Well, no. I mean, everybody would know what John, which God John is referring to, so he doesn't actually use the definite article. It's so clear that even the Jehovah's Witnesses understand what John means, but do you understand they just violated their principle because the definite article is not used, and yet they believe that it's God who sent John, not a God, but the God. And let's not forget that John 1.1 1, 1 is not the only verse we have in the Bible regarding the deity of Jesus Christ. Remember that he is universally seen to be God by the apostles. Paul writes in Romans 9, verses 4 through 5, uh, I think verse 5 in particular, one of the clearest verses, I think I may have already used this one before. He, he talks about the Jews who are the Israelites, to whom belongs the adoption of the sons and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the temple service and the promises. Who are the fathers or whose are the fathers? 
and from whom is the Christ according to the flesh, who is over all God blessed forever. And again, if you understand what that means, actually I think I might have included this in this evening as well. He is, what Paul is saying here is he is literally the eternally blessed God who is over all. That's what he's saying about Jesus. He may be a Jew according to the flesh, but he is God from all eternity, the blessed God, the infinitely blessed one. The author to the Hebrews quoting Psalm 45 and applying it to Jesus writes this in Hebrews 1 verses 8 and 9. But of the Son, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. And the righteous scepter is the scepter of his kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness above your companions. Quoting Isaiah 7, uh, verse 14, Matthew writes this regarding the conception of Jesus in, in Matthew 1, verses 22 and 23. Now all this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall be with child and shall bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which translated God is God with us. Now why would the child be called Emmanuel, God with us? Is it because God has visited his people with salvation and in this child because he sent him into the world? Not just for that reason. It's because God himself is with us in human flesh. He's become one with us in order to save us. You know, every name given to him by the angel points to who this Jesus is. When Joseph wanted to put Mary away because of her conception outside of wedlock, an angel appeared to him in a dream and said this in Matthew 1, 20 and 21, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child who has been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son. And you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Now, Jesus is a Greek word, but it's the Greek transliteration of the Hebrew word Joshua. Maybe some of you have the King James Version and been reading in Hebrews 3 and 4, and you come across this idea for if Jesus had given them rest, then they wouldn't have spoken of another day. But in your more modern translations, it says Joshua. Well, the word Jesus and Joshua are basically the same word. But what does Joshua mean? Well, Joshua is a, is a shortened form of the Hebrew word Yahweh Shua, which means the Lord is salvation. Yah is a shortened form of Yahweh. Shua means salvation. Yahshua, the Lord is salvation. You shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. In other words, the Lord is coming into the world to save his own people. We're going to see that he came to his own, but his own didn't receive him. But as many as received him, to them he, came, he gave the right to become the children of God. Now again, there's many other ways that Jesus reveals himself to be God. But this should be enough to convince you of what John is actually saying. Now let me just make one final point. And this will tie in with what we're looking at this evening. It's clear from what John says that the Word, or Jesus, is not the only person who is called God. John writes in verse 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. And he writes in verse 2, he was in the beginning with God. Now John's already told us plainly that Jesus is God, but you know, here's another, uh, there, there's, well, there's another one who is <laughs> called God. Okay, another person. And that's, seen here by the simple fact that one cannot be with oneself, even when one is God. Now, Jesus here is making reference, as I've said, to the biblical teaching of the Trinity, that there is one God, but there are three persons that are this one God. When he says here that the Word was with God, he means that the Son of God was with the Father. We read in verse 14, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw his glory, glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. And in verse 18, no one has seen God at any time. The only begotten God who is in the bosom of the Father, he has explained him. 
Perhaps we can explore that a little bit this evening, or maybe we'll look at that when we reach verse 18. But notice that the Word became flesh. We saw His glory. Glory is the only begotten from the Father. And then the idea that He is the only begotten God in the bosom of the Father. You see, He's the eternally begotten Son. He's with the Father. But both the Father and the Son are God. The Word was God, and the Word was with God. Jesus is the Son of God. He is one of the three divine persons in the Godhead. Uh, by the way, He is not the Father, as I mentioned before. The apostolic and United Pentecostal churches believe that there's only one person in the Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are all referring to basically one person. But they are three persons, and we'll look at that a little bit more this evening. So who is this Jesus that you must believe in to be saved? He is the eternal God, John says. He's the one who created the heavens and the earth. He created all things visible and invisible. He is the one who came into this world, who lived for you, who died on the cross for you. He is the only Savior that God has actually given mankind, the only one who can save you. And so let me ask you this question this morning. Is this the Jesus that you are believing in? Is this the one that you are trusting? John's already told us that you can't be saved unless you believe this, that he is, this one. In John 20, verse 31, but these things have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. It's not enough to believe he is the Christ, the Messiah, as we saw last week, was clearly revealed to be God. You have to believe that this is God in human flesh, that that is who the Messiah is. Jesus says essentially the same thing in John 8:24. He says to the Jews, therefore I said to you that you will die in your sins. For unless you believe that I am, you will die in your sins. Remember the word he there is simply included by the translators. It's not in the original language. He says, unless you believe that I am, you will die in your sins. Before Abraham was born, I am. The Jews picked up stones to stone him because you, being a man, make yourself out to be God. Jesus says you have to believe that if you're going to be saved. So is this the Jesus you, you believe in? Have you actually believed on Him? Have you actually trusted Him? Have you actually received Him? Are you relying upon Him alone to enter into heaven? And does your life show that you have trusted Him by doing what the Lord calls you to do? Jesus on one occasion said, why do you call me Lord, Lord? but you don't do what I say. You see, that's a contradiction in terms. When you say that someone is Lord, that means, hey, you're in charge, and I submit to your will. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, but do not what I say? You have to do what Jesus says. If you are trusting Him as your Savior, you must surrender to Him as Lord, and the fact that you are, and you're doing it because you love Him. Because you want to do that, because what he tells you to do is, is actually what you want to do. That is the evidence that you really are trusting Jesus, that you really have been saved by his grace. Well, if you're not trusting the Lord this morning, the Lord invites you to do so. That's the reason why he has ordained that his gospel be preached. Let me close with the invitation through Isaiah. Isaiah 45, verse 22, and again, look at this in terms of who it is that's really speaking. This is the pre-incarnate Jesus Christ, the Son of God, but it is God speaking to you, and He is offering Himself to His people even then, actually, to the world. He says, turn to me and be saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am God, and there is no other. If you would be saved, you must trust in this Messiah in this Son of God, God in human flesh. Believe on Him and be saved all the ends of the earth. Let's bow in a moment of prayer and let's ask the Lord to apply His Word to us.